Uh, but I'm really excited to introduce this panel without our, our speaker because, uh, do you remember that Clint, when he did the uh, election thing, when he did, and he just spoke to the empty chair? That's right. So, I, I also, have, I ran CES's trade conferences for many years. I came out of publishing, and I will tell you that when you come to a show, like Toy Fair, or like CES, or like E3, you're there in a moment in time, and sometimes you forget to see history, and history is super creative, and it's also, people don't change. The things kids loved when you were kids are the things that kids love today, and both Tom Kalinske, who um, is a longtime Toy Association um, active participant and has a storied past um, in many different uh, gaming endeavors, and Nolan, have just continued to create and innovate and explore and bring joy to kids and their families all over. So I asked Val Vacante from Collapsco, uh, who does a lot in the toy industry, if she would bring Tom and Nolan together, and Tom would introduce Nolan, who's still not here, but I think what we're gonna do until he walks in the door is talk about him. No, we're gonna talk to each other. Yeah. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Val, and I'm going to leave Nolan in his empty chair. Okay, he's, he's with us in spirit at the moment. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks so much for taking time out of Toy Fair to join us. As Robin mentioned, I'm Valerie Vacante, founder of Collapsco. Uh, we really work with uh, uncovering innovation, new trends, and really pairing up you know, collaborative teams all around the world. And today I am very excited and honored to be visiting with Tom and Nolan both. And we're gonna kind of kick it off with Tom and I just having a chat. Um, about some of his experiences, because Tom has seen the future throughout his career and helped shape it. So, um, so yeah, I guess we'll just start there. Did you want to introduce? Great. Well, and by the way, I've known Nolan a long, long time, and he likes to be late. <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> perfect entrance, Nolan. That's perfect. <laughs> I'm Me been too. Here. This is my 49th toy fair, and I got lost <laughs> again. Okay. Now for some pontification. <laughs> so, Nolan, we were we were just getting started. Tom, I didn't know if you wanted to. Well, I want to introduce him. Yeah. Because... Go for it. Can you hear me? All right. So, hi, Nolan. Hi. Nolan and I've known each other a long time. And it's just an honor for me to introduce him. Uh, uh, it, when I started looking at his his uh, accomplishments, I actually had to write, even though I've known him for a long time, I had to write a lot of it down because he has done so much that I wasn't even aware of, of, of quite a bit of it. I mean, obviously, we all know he's a tech pioneer. We know he's a creative genius. We know he's a forward thinker. We know he's been a successful entrepreneur many times over. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff, too, that he's, that he's done. So, you know, he was the founder of Atari and therefore the founder of the video game industry, which back then, I guess it was a few hundred million dollars, and today it's a hundred and forty billion dollar industry, twice the size of, well, it's, the, it's larger than the movie and uh, uh, movie and music industries combined. The video game industry is larger than movie and music combined. There are Clearly more... pe pe peaked too early. We peaked too early. Yeah, we, we did. We got out too early. <laughs> uh, more people are watching other video game players play video games on a Sunday afternoon than are watching an NFL football game today. So there's a lot of really great stuff from that. But besides, besides that, he founded uh, Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater. Uh, I remember he founded a, a robot company, and robot or something. Right. Yeah. Uh, but what I didn't know what I didn't know about Nolan is that he also created uh, the first car navigation system and the technology for that, uh, E-Tech, e -tech, is still being used in car navigation systems today. Uh, I mentioned the robotic company, uh, and he's been, he's been very big in brain research, and by the way, and also using technology to improve education, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And, 
I'm glad that you are using your great brain to help do that too. Uh, but the other things he did, uh, a very flat organizational structure, more women in management than any other company had back in, uh, back in those days. Um, also, he had Steve Jobs and Waz working for him. Can you imagine that? <laughs> that must have been fun. Well, I, uh, I, I turned down a third of Apple computer for fifty thousand dollars. So you know, it's a little bittersweet. But he's all, always been very big at getting uh, teamwork together, getting people to work well in, in teams, and inspiring creativity, which I'm sure is what he's what he can talk some about to today, and using creativity as a competitive advantage over over other 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 companies. He founded Catalyst Tech. Catalyst Tech was the first incubator. You all read about WeWork and uh, and different uh, incubators today. Well, this guy founded the first one that was a long time ago. That was ever done. Um, and then buy, buy video, the first online ordering system quite a while ago. And of course, we all know what's happened with uh, online, online ordering today. I, I could have been Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and he's consulted for a whole bunch of tech companies in Silicon Valley. He's in the Tech Museum in Silicon Valley. They have a thing they call him a revolutionary. Uh, Newsweek magazine said he's one of the top 50 people who have shaped America. That's kind of a nice honor. He's in the video hall. The video. question is, was it for the better? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. He's in the video game hall of fame. Uh, and, and just, you know, you've done so many unbelievable things. And I can hardly wait to see what the heck Versix is uh, and what you're doing with St. Noir. Uh, I heard a little bit about it, that you're using uh, Alexa, and then it's very theatrical, obviously voice-oriented, so I can hardly wait to see that because I still love video games, as you know. So anyway, that's my friend, Nolan Bushnell. Yeah, I, you know, Tom and I, we met when, when he stepped on my hand when I was crawling out of a bar one night. And, <laughs> and uh, no, Tom and I actually tried to buy Atari back. We did. We tried to buy Atari back years ago. That failed. Well, that's because the, the people who owned it at the time, the, uh, they, they were from France, and, and they had most of their friends on the board who were making big salaries, and they just didn't want to give it up, even though Nolan could have run it a heck of a lot better than they were, and he pointed that out to him, which I think might have offended him a little bit. <laughs> I tend to be offensive. <laughs> Well, I'm just going to jump in here and want, obviously the common theme of the conversation is both of you guys in your in different aspects of your career have pioneered the future. Uh, Nolan, I think one of the common themes that uh, yourself and I have talked about and Nancy is you always being ahead of your time and timing kind of being everything. So I guess we'll just start way back with Atari and tell us about your vision that you had there and how you got things going and any Atari starter stories? Well, what a lot of people don't realize is that Pong was actually my second game. And one of the curses of the engineering mind is that you think that complexity is going to be rewarded by the public. And I started out with computer space, which was actually kind of a technical tour de force. And it was okay, but, you know, it wasn't considered a big hit. And then we did Pong, which compared to computer space was a dawdle, <laughs> you know. And that it just took off. But it was so simple that anybody with a garage shop could knock it off. And they did. And so of the Pong games that we sold, we only hit about a 20% of the market, the knockoffs, wow. took over the rest of them. And what was happening is we had no money, we had no manufacturing expertise, we were just, you know, a couple of guys named Mo trying to do things. <laughs> and, uh, and all the rest of the companies were better capitalized, had better relationships with distribu distribution. So we had one tool. We had to outcreate them. And so creativity turned out to be the linchpin of being able to end up with an 
97% market share five years later. And so it really gave me a very, very strong love and respect for innovation. And I think that has been sort of the, the watchword. Now, there are, kind, there are two kinds of innovations. There's the innovation of science, science projects, where you're really looking at the world and doing great tech. But I like to be the metaphorical poet. And the metaphorical poet was to interpret the gods for the masses. And so I've said, I want to be the metaphorical poet that translates technology to the masses. And so I look for technologies that are really cool, but are not mainstream, but then can be adapted to things that become mainstream. And I think that's been kind of the, the key. Whenever I've tried to do a science project, like Anderbot, I lost a lot of money on the robotics business because it was a science project and though so much of the tech had not been developed yet. And that's that's you being ahead of your time and that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, and so, so that is, is kind of where I've kind of looked and said, what are, what does Nolan Bushnell work on? And that's kind of why I wanted to get involved in the smart speaker world. And the smart speaker world is really AI, but there's also a very interesting cultural thing going on. Board games, by their nature, are social. Video games, by their nature, are isolating. I mean, playing with a million other people in your basement in your underwear is not social. <laughs> you know, but board games are. And so what I wanted to do, and I've always felt that the interesting things in the world happen at collision points. When tectonic plates hit each other, that's where the earthquakes and the volcanoes are. And so I said to myself, what if we were to collide board games and video games? Take the best, and it couldn't be screens because when you're focusing on a screen, even if you're around a table, it tends to be more isolating. So it had to be audio. And the next phase was how can we get rid of the friction in a board game? And how can we enhance the experience? And so how many board games have you seen that have had a little, you know, sand timer, you know, an hourglass timer? That's really a crappy timer. <laughs> you know? And an Alexa is a really, really good timer. Alexa can throw a seven-sided dice. It can keep track of things. It can provide sound effects and music. But more than that, it can now do a artificial MPC, non-playing character, a synthetic character that can add to the fun. And so that's kind of the view from 10,000 feet of what we're trying to do at Versix. And uh, we're, <laughs> and we, we started out with the tour de force. We won some rewards and everything the same you are. But it's a tough game. It was aimed at young adults. And so this year we're doing a bunch of things aimed at kids, aimed at kids and learning. And uh, we think that uh, we can fundamentally change the world again. And that's what we're doing. Where can you find them? Where, where, uh, how do I find the games? Where do we go? We, um, Saint Noir is available on Amazon right now, um, and the, our other games will probably uh, will not be out until probably middle middle third quarter, and uh, and we're also working with a few of the other big game companies and doing some things for them and uh, looking kind of forward to all 
the weird stuff on our future. And it's really exciting what's happening with Versix right now is basically, um, you know, St. Noir, as Nolan mentioned, you know, is really targeted towards young adults and really getting people playing in new ways. Uh, what's really exciting, though, with Versix, it's really that idea of what Nolan was saying of kind of remixing different technologies together for that new ways to play. And so it is, uh, it's not just voice, right? So some of the things Versix are experimenting with are machine learning, right? And recognition and um, different, um, let's see, machine learning, we talk about AI, also augmented reality, how we're talking about some of that with some of the board game experiences. I'm not gonna try and give away too much because we can't really talk about the portfolio. But, uh, but those are some of the things that are being experimented right now. I know with Nolan and Zay and, um, and really a range of um, ages. Nolan talked about learning. So again, not giving too much away, but you'll start seeing things, exploring languages, exploring um, putting kind of fun first. You know, I think as when we're designing games, at least in my experience, and I'd love to know your take from being at LeapFrog in education, um, for me, the best experiences are really starting with that fun first and then adding those sort of layers of learning, whereas I think kids know whenever you go learning first and then try and add a character to it or try and, it's like you're trying too hard and they get it and they can see through it. So well, we also believe in creepy. <laughs> you know, and uh, think about a board game that you play in the dark. And it's, it's a little scary, a little weird. I like weird. <laughs> Tom, what are you up to? Well, um, I'm actually a little bit back in the video game business. I'm chairman of a company called Mixed Dimensions, and we like to talk about uh, bits to atoms. So we have a technology, as, as you know, people now create their own character in a lot of video games. They personalize it, they decide what uniform he's gonna have on, what weapons he's gonna have. With our technology, you can click on that character and we will 3D print you a very high quality replica of that character in full color. Uh, looks like a piece of artwork, frankly. So you now have on your desk or uh, in, your, in your bedroom a, a character that you used to only see on a screen. Now you have a physical form of it. And we could do that with spaceships or characters or, or vehicles or, or whatever. I want some of those. Yeah, it's, it's really cool, actually. I mean, and uh, you remember the old Invisible Man product when we were young? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we can also print transparent. And we did a thing on Kickstarter where we print, for, for, again, for schools mainly, uh, we printed an Invisible Man about 12 inches high, showing all of the bone structures and organs inside of, inside of the body. So I'm, I'm involved with that right now, and then I'm still I'm still mentoring uh, education technology startups at something called GSV Labs, Global Silicon Valley, yeah. and in Silicon Valley. You know, I, I think I can beat you. <laughs> I think I can I can sell a totally invisible man for a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have I have a question. I want to I do want to know more about about exactly what you said. So if I'm playing whatever video game, yeah. and I'm in, I'm in the current season, and I've got my character, I've got yeah. my skin, and then I just like scan it, and then... You, you, they, they have to have, the game has to, whoever owns the game has to give permission. Okay. If they give permission, which Ubisoft has done, and uh, Cryptic has done, and some other studios have done, Blizzard's done, you just click on it, and uh, then we, we have to print it at our, at our shop, basically. Yeah, we have these machines that print are from Mimaki in Japan. They're 250 grand a piece, so they're not something you can have in your home very easily. Uh, and we've got a bunch of them, and we will then ship you the character that you created in physical form, and uh, and you can enjoy it. So every season, I can be like boom, 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 boom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We like to think about it as the factory of the future, except that we're never going to be making hundreds of thousands of things. These are very personalized, very uh, one-off, if you will. Your creation is different than anybody else's creation. I actually be believe that, I call it the atomization of products, yeah. which I think is part of the future. People are, I'm on the, on the board of a self-driving car company. I've always kind of had this thing with automation. And we talk all the time about 
you know, self-driving cars fully deployed eliminate about 15 million U.S. jobs. And uh, it's not just the drivers, it's, you know, auto body shops and, and insurance adjusters and, and traffic cops, and <laughs> there's a lot of things, you know, parking lot attendants. And so the question is, who's, what's, what's, the, what's the nature of work? And I actually think that's a thread in which we atomize and things become important for their uniqueness. Yes, yes. And like, you know, what's the atomization of farming? It's farmers markets as opposed to factory farms. And you see that growing exponentially in terms of uh, what's happening. I mean, we, I think my wife hasn't bought things from a grocery store for years. Mm. You know, yeah, and that's not typical for the rest of the nation. It's very typical in California right now. Oh yeah, very very much so. And I want to talk about you talked about the different technologies kind of inspiring other innovations, and you talked about self-driving cars. But like, let's rewind it back. You had mentioned Nolan's work with ETAC. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I think is interesting when I look in kind of like the archives or some of the work with ETAC, it's just so interesting. If you guys haven't seen it, it you can really tell that you've taken the, the video game inspiration and how that's fed into there. Can, can you tell us a little bit? ETAC was actually really funny. I wrote the business plan at four in the morning over the chart table in the middle of the Pacific. And to put it in context, you could get a sat nav. This was before GPS, but you could only get a fix once every 24 hours. It was a uh, it was a really dumb satellite, and it used Doppler and that sort of stuff. And and so, what we all, always want to do then is do dead reckoning from the point of an absolute fix, lat latitude, longitude, to make sure that you knew approximately where the boat was going to be in case you hit something and you were going to sink really quickly. And so we were doing that and we said, boy, you know, this would be really easy to do if I, we didn't have all this squishy stuff under us. And then we said, you know, this would be really easy to do in a car. And so we got through, we were doing a race from Newport to Hawaii. And I thought, my, and, and my, my uh, uh, one of the guys that was on the boat that was SRI, a guy named Stan Nunny, who was really, really a, a, a clever fellow and a good navigator. And I said, hey, let's start an automobile navigation company uh, when we get off. <laughs> and we did. I, I, I love that you were on a boat to talk about cars, to start a car automotive um, tracker. <laughs> um, one of the things, actually, and ETEC came out of Catalyst Technologies, right? The, and so tell us, you know, as we're seeing more startups come on the scene in the toy and game areas, and really that idea of incubators, accelerators, and all of that being popular now, I mean, that's kind of what you are doing. So I guess share with us a little bit about Catalyst Technologies and some of your philosophy behind it. The idea was to fund a company with a key. And the key would open a door, and on the desk there would be a pile of papers. The entrepreneur would sign his name or her name you know, 15 times. The bank account would be set up, the, the, the books would be set up, the health insurance, the, all the regulation, and they could be working on their project that afternoon. Whereas a typical startup, from the time you, the money comes in, it's a month before you get all, all the stuff going. And we, we felt that a startup doesn't need a CFO. It doesn't need a lot of people because at that time you can use maybe a tenth of a person. You know, it's very hard to hire a tenth of a person. 
So, so the idea was that we would aggregate some of the early issues of, of, of a company and gain the speed as well as the efficiency. And it really worked, kind of. And the issue is that good companies thrive and leave. Bad companies fester and stay. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's no failing company that can't be fixed with a little more time and a little more money. <laughs> and, and that's what, <clears throat> I'm at uh, GSB Labs now, they've taken your idea, but they've added the time element to it. So when a startup is accepted at GSV Labs, and we provide the, the financial help, the printing, the Wi-Fi, the legal help, all that stuff, but they only have three months to prepare their business plan and present it and start getting angel funding. And when, once, assuming that once they get angel funding, it'll actually happen and they'll get further funding after that. But if they don't get to the point where the business plan is accepted and they get angel funding, we ask them to leave the facility. So they stay in there for three months, develop that idea. And the other beauty of it is, though, as you know, and when these startups, and we've got 180 startups in this one big building in, 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 uh, in San Mateo, they feed off one another. So there's a lot of synergies that occur. A lot of better ideas are created by these startups all talking to each other, even though they might be in different areas. One might be in sustainability, another one might be in entertainment. But they, they feed off of one another, and it tends to make for a better a better company. But the fact that I, bet, I bet there's some aggregation where somebody from here and that they say well, maybe we should join forces. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, see, you're you're smarter than I was. <laughs> no. But but Nolan, I mean, wasn't there a similar thing in Catalyst Technologies, like with Androbot, and then you had Axlon around the same time? So is it, wouldn't that be kind of a similar situation? Because you were kind of in robotics, and then Axlon was more kind of electronic toys, some robotics. So did that same kind of scenario happen there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there, you know, in, in the final analysis, there's just a lot of really important things that need to be built. And I, I'm, I'm a great believer in reading science fiction as potential history. <laughs> you know, all the ideas come out of the pages of science fiction. All you have to do is execute them. Well, in children's TV shows, look at the Jetsons. We're living in the Jetsons world today. Exactly. I mean, stop to think about where we've come in 20 years and try to extrapolate where we'll be in 20 years from now. It's frightening and exciting. So I want to talk about uh, Axlon for a moment, continuing the thread. So if you guys don't know, Axlon was uh, one of Nolan's companies out of Catalyst Technologies. Again, a lot of electronic toys and robots, which I'm personally a fan of. <laughs> Being sort of a, a researcher in connected play. So I, I really love reading the history about Axlon. But uh, tell us tell us a success story that came out of that, that obviously started in Catalyst Technologies. Well, Axlon, There was a piece of technology that a lot of people didn't focus on, but it was really the dawn of the single chip micro. And you could get a really pretty powerful, I mean, nothing like you can get today, but you could get a pretty, pretty powerful single chip micro for 80 cents. And so all of a sudden, pretty smart toys were possible. And we created an electronic cat that could turn and follow sounds, and you could communicate with it by clapping. And, and it was really fun. The kids loved it. We did a thing called AG Bear, which was a single chip micro that listened to verbal input, turned it upside down, bearized it, and fed it back to the kid. And so you'd say, G-A-G, I love you. And he'd come back and he'd say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> now, 
to a kid, they know exactly what the bear said because they're overlaying the structure of the sound with meaning that their mind creates. And, uh, and it was one of those things that was just very, very successful. One of the characteristics that we never expected, but a lot of people in rest homes, things like that, that were maybe cognitively impaired in their later age, AG became their very best friend. Because AG would listen to them instead of their terrible son who didn't really care about their aches and pains. <laughs> and when we, uh, when we did some of these, the, uh, some focus groups on that, it turns out that 20% of our bears ended up with the aging population, which we never anticipated. Well, and there's a couple of things I think that are really interesting about that story, and that is like obviously now with Versix working in with voice activation, not just Alexa, but also you know every voice platform, but also what you just talked about, AG Bear, and really you know using that kind of voice technology and that interaction. So way back then, it was like 30 years ago ish. It's way too um, long. <laughs> I'm very old. But, um, but no, I think, and that's what I think is incredible about the work that Versix is doing, is kind of taking those learnings from a long time ago, taking those older technologies, taking these new technologies and kind of mixing them together. Um, the other part that I thought was really interesting about that story was I didn't know, I didn't know that about the, the AG Bear being in, you know, the older community and everything, which makes perfect sense. And I'm sure a lot of you may or may not be aware that Hasbro actually invested uh, in something similar for the elderly community. And it was making robotic pets. You don't have to clean up after them. They always listen well, to we them. Sold our company. <laughs> we sold our company to Hasbro. We, <laughs> there was this weird time when the video game business was struggling. And we thought that we didn't have enough compute power to render backgrounds, but plenty of compute power to render characters. So we felt that we could put a video game on a VCR cartridge, and the VCR would, would create the backgrounds, and we could just overlay with a screen map on top of that. And uh, that's actually what we ended up selling to Hasbro. And, uh, and it, was, it was interesting technology, but the, the authoring cost was a little bit scary because we had to do things, but anyway. And so, yeah, I, I, I love that story because it was creating Catalyst Technologies. It's creating a startup in there. It's taking those technologies, bringing them to market, and then having your exit strategy selling to Hasbro, so that's great, awesome. And so, so now let's switch gears over to Mattel for a moment. So Tom, you were CEO of Mattel at a really important time in the 80s. Um, and one of, I would love you to share the story with us about um, the creativity and innovation and inspiration and how everything happened with He-Man. Oh boy. So, uh... <laughs> Because it's back. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, you know, at, at Mattel, we obviously had Barbie, and we had uh, Hot Wheels, and we had CNCs and a large preschool line. This was before Mattel bought Fisher Price, before Mattel bought American Girl, although I had the first meetings with President Roland trying to buy American Girl. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't get that done. Um, it, we, we didn't have a male action figure, right? We did, Hasbro had G.I. Joe. Kenner, which Hasbro bought, had Star Wars. We didn't have, we had a guy named Big Jim who wasn't such a big business and uh, it wasn't a, a, a great seller. And so this is one of those times when the creation of a line actually came out of an awful lot of market research, which is not always the case. A lot of times it's just out of sheer, sheer creativity of some guy who's a genius and he creates something. Well, this was a case where we did drawing after drawing after drawing of every theme imaginable. The, the uh, Marvel characters themes, the DC Comics themes, the policemen, firemen, 
you name it. We had art, an artist draw these characters on beach, what we call bee sheets, large drawings. And we started researching it with, with boys. Well, it turned out that one of these drawings of a very muscular guy uh, ended up winning this research. So then we made models of it, uh, you know, out of, uh, out of, uh, out of uh, clay and modeled that up and researched it again. And he, the character became known as He-Man, kept winning that research. And He-Man, as you will recall, had an arch villain named Skeletor and they, they fought it out in Castle Grayskull. Well, so we did introduce this line and we, we were very successful. We got to about 75 million in revenue, which in those days was pretty good. Uh, the chairman of the company walked in my office one day, though, and he said, well, you did 75 million, but it'll never be as big as Star Wars or G.I. Joe because you don't have a TV show or a movie and you can't get one. And I said, you want to bet? And so <laughs> we then worked with uh, Filmation Studios and, uh, and actually Haim Saban, uh, who's now a billionaire many times over, uh, and we created the television show, He-Man Masters of the Universe. The way we got it on air was kind of unique. We gave it away free to television stations across the United States. And in return, they had to give us back three 30-second commercial times that we would then either sell to McDonald's or Kellogg's or use ourselves. We couldn't use it for He-Man because that would have been broken some, uh, some nafty rules. Anyway, the television show was so, and, and by the way, we invested three and a half million dollars in the, in the television show. Uh, Group W Westinghouse invested three and a half million dollars in the television show. So it was a seven million dollar investment to get 65 half hours done. And you need that for a, a full run for a full season. Well, the show was so successful, we ended up making a profit off of the television show advertising time that we sold to McDonald's and Kellogg's and General Foods and other people. And that was never anticipated. And obviously having the show on air, uh, Peggy Charon, rest her soul, used to say, oh, it's a 30-minute commercial. We, of course, denied that. Uh, we said, no, no, this is, this is life lessons we're teaching. We're teaching right, good versus evil. Uh, anyway, uh, the business grew to $750 million. Uh, and so it sort of explained how, how he made Masters of the Universe became so successful. And then, of course, his, his sister, She-Ra, came out of that show. And we did another whole series of shows on She-Ra, Princess of Power. But it all came out of really marketing research and then the challenge, can you get a television show done or not? Great. No, I Solve problems one at a time. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting that, I mean, similarly to how, you know, Nolan, what you did with Axelon and what you did with Catalyst, similarly what you've done, you know, with He-Man and She-Ra, you know, we're seeing that same kind of pattern now, right? When you talk about reinventing entertainment, I mean, Mattel now being an entertainment company, right? And really trying to connect those entertainment experiences with the toy experiences. And so you saw the future 30 years ago as well. Well, they've taken it to a new extreme now. I think they're, they're really going to try to get every one of their brands on television or in a movie. And I, and I applaud the effort because we are in an entertainment business. We are enriching the lives of children and families. Uh, I'm very pleased that you may have noticed that the Sonic the Hedgehog movie was the hit movie uh, last week, or still is. And it's based, obviously, on the video game character that we created at, uh, at, at Sega. And it's the first time, I think, since the original Pokemon that a video game character has resulted in a successful movie. There have been a whole lot of video game characters that were translated to movies that failed. Well, this one's been very, very successful. The box office was over 100 million last weekend. Well, one of the things I'm really excited about talking with both of you gentlemen here is that Nolan, obviously being the pioneer of the video game industry with Atari, um, and really kind of experiencing the first console wars, so, right, it was Atari and Intellivision back in 1979, 40 years ago-ish. Um, and really, you know, if you guys haven't seen any of the commercials or anything, I mean, you guys, your marketing was just hitting it back and, back and forth with each other, you know? So well, I have to beg off on that a little bit because most of the wars, the console wars, happened after I sold Atari. And the console wars wouldn't have happened if I hadn't sold it. 
because <laughs> I believe, I really believe in dirty tricks. <laughs> and, and when, in order to build a console game, you needed a microprocessor, but then you needed a custom chip, which was used in channel technology. At the time, there were four places in the world that had N channel. Texas Instruments, IBM, General Instruments, and um, one more, I forget it. So what I went out and I tied up on an exclusive basis everybody except IBM, and IBM didn't want to talk to me. So that in those days, it took about a year, if not more, to do a generation. And you could always find something wrong with it, so you had to modify it to get another chip. So I basically tied up the total possibility of anybody ever competing with me. Well, after I sold to Warner, they put a guy named Ray Kassar, who was in the, ray, in, in the rag business, and he didn't know tech from, to, from tofu. And, and he looked at me having tied up, you know, three different things for the next generation. He says, we only need one of them. Let's just get the best and get rid of these others. It'll save us $50,000 a year. And, and so he did that. One went to Mattel, one went to Bally, and the other one went to something, I don't know. Anyway, so all of a sudden, I created all our, pro all our competition serendipitously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I could have definitely held everybody out of the market for another two years. I love that. Dirty tricks. <laughs> but it, it, it goes to, again, you seeing the future, right? So you completely prepared, covered everything, sold, and then... <laughs> Um, but I, I wanted to bring up the console wars, obviously, because you, you're both here, um, Atari, and then we have Sega. So, Sega. <laughs> Sega. <laughs> well, Sega, Sega won against Nintendo. Yes. Yeah. Nintendo was the 90-pound gorilla at the time, and you guys, you guys rocked. We did nerd dirty tricks, too. <laughs> that was part of the way we won. There was one CES where... Uh, we got wind that Nintendo was going to lower the price on the on their console, and uh, and that was going to hurt us obviously quite a bit at Sega. So we worked all night. Team worked all night, and we found a printer that printed new price lists. We printed the front page of fake newspapers, LA Times newspapers, with Sega drops price, and we put it under the doors of every buyer's hotel room in Los Angeles. So that morning, before Nintendo could announce their price reduction, we had already announced our price reduction, and therefore it looked like, once again, Nintendo was just copying us. And <laughs> See, that's good stuff. That was good. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, well, I guess tell us, yeah, tell, so that was, a, that was an amazing story. I'm picturing you like, Oh, yeah. Um, but, I mean, tell us a little bit about, you know, your experience at Sega, just, like, from start to... Well, you know, I, I was uh, tracked down by the, the, the CEO from Japan to, uh, to come run Sega of America, and initially I thought he was crazy. Why would I want to do this, take on... Well, he was crazy. <laughs> he was crazy, yes. But why would I want to take on the 90-pound gorilla? Nintendo had 95% share of the market, so taking them on was going to be a very formidable task. But when I went back to Japan and I saw 16-bit technology versus 8-bit Nintendo technology, that blew me away. And, and, and I remember, I had only known in, in television technology, what do you want to call that, 2-bit technology. <laughs> so the, the leap for me from what I had known video games to be to 16-bit was very dramatic. It was overwhelming, and I was so impressed by it. 
And then I was so impressed by what you could do with the technology, how involving the games were and, and could become, uh, how good sports games could become. Of course, now you can't tell the difference between a, a sport, a football game, and a real football game on TV. It's so good. But back then, what I saw was dramatically different, and it gave me the courage to take on this role. But I said to the CEO of, uh, of, of Sega Japan that you have to let me do it the American way. We have to sign up American licenses. We're, we're going to develop more sports games in the United States. We're going to have sports characters running our games, or our, our stars of our games, like Joe Montana, and of course EA had Madden football, and we had uh, Tommy Lasorda baseball, and uh, you know Mario Lemieux hockey, and all this stuff. We're going to take them on through sports, American licenses, and we're going to make fun of Nintendo in our advertising. We're going to position them as the little kid system. We're going to be the big adult system. We're going to target teenagers and college age students. We had a college kid on every campus in America. We sent him Sega hardware, Genesis hardware, and video games every day. And all he had to do was walk around campus, go to a different dorm or fraternity, and play the video games. And so this was kind of our underground way of, of marketing. Uh, anyway, the the chairman of, of, Mattel, of Mattel, of Sega, did not want to do this. And he literally started to leave the boardroom when I had presented my, my ideas on what we were going to do against Nintendo. And he turned at the door and he said, well, when I hired you, I said you could do it your way in America, so go ahead and do this stuff. And of course we did, and it was, it was very, very successful. And uh, to my amazement, uh, uh, the book Console Wars was written uh, about the, that battle. And, uh, and by the way, the movie is premiering at South by Southwest in two weeks, at, you know, March 16th. Uh, so it was, it was really a fun, fun time for me, a fun experience, uh, helped start, uh, he built the video game business, I kind of took it up a little bit more, and today we all, as I said earlier, it's just an enormous business, much bigger than any of us had ever thought it could be. I want to talk a minute, a little bit about my most successful products. I have eight children, and right <laughs> now, I... <laughs> we have a football team between us. <laughs> exactly, and so, right now, my oldest son has a micro amusement park in downtown LA, 50,000 square feet of the most mind-bending game so you can ever play. My youngest son has built three of the attractions that are the highest earning in their, the place. My second son has a console system that is like for coin on. And uh, I have a software programmer and a laser OpenGL programmer. And that's the true legacy. And uh, I just want to be really, really proud of them. Oh, and my, I've got three daughters. None of them wanted to do anything in the game business, with the exception of PR and managing the money. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you have a, you, you, you talked about a football team. It's like a it's like a mini company <laughs> that you have. You got PR, marketing covered. You got development, design, <laughs> location based entertainment. <laughs> location based entertainment. It's a great one. So go to Two Bit Circus if you're in LA, and you'll have a ball. Has anybody been there? Oh, okay. Excellent. You like it? Well, you know, Wyatt did uh, King of the Road and Battle Bowling, and he actually did the Space Squad. So. Cool. Well, I think we're almost out of time. Any anything else that you guys want to add or leave anybody with? Anything we need to see and look ahead for? Keep playing. <laughs> Have fun. I mean, one of the things about the businesses that we're in. We're like little honeybees, in which we're creating happiness wherever we pollinate. Well, I think it's more than just the kids, too. I mean, we really have created experiences that families have really enjoyed and brought families together. And I think that's a really important thing that you have done uh, all your whole life. And I've tried to follow in your footsteps. <laughs>
Well, you know, that's that that was really the genesis for Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. Well, and just um, to that note, that idea of like bringing families and people back together, just to kind of end on a Versix note, you know, that's really what's happening at Versix, the idea of getting people playing together in new ways. And so it's just interesting, you started your career that way, and then here we are years later, still seeing the future, making the future, and getting people playing together. And so I think that's a, that's a good thing. And I've only had one idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you.